Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Transatlantic Rebels podcast. My name is Jessel, and this is... Roshari. And today we will be talking about MIA's fourth album from 2013 called Matangi. Okay, Rashad, I've got a feeling that this, now this is just a guess based on the last three podcasts, <laughs> perhaps this is your favourite MIA album so far. Yes. Due to that, I think that you should take the lead on this in terms of explaining to us all the kind of okay. ins and outs of it. What I will be doing is uh, kind of similar to my review. I won't be going so deep into the spirituality element of it. I'll be okay. talking more about the kind of structure of the album Okay. and about what songs I thought worked, what songs didn't, the music, the kind of more traditional elements, whereas you can maybe fill us in on the really deep conceptual shit, basically. Okay. How's that sound? That sounds fine. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So should we kind of start with like what happened before this album came out? Since you're American. Okay. What happened with the Super Bowl? Here goes with simple. So I guess Madonna was coming out with a new album. And as usual, what Madonna usually does is she kind of like pulls like people who are either hot or somewhat controversial to like like help her come out whatever she comes out with. So I guess at this point she picked up Mickey Minaj, who's pretty much like the hottest rapper at the point, and she pulled M.I.A., which is quote unquote like probably like the most controversial artist at the point. So my idea, my my thing going into this is is that even before the show started, I'm like okay. So you got Nicki Minaj, you got M.I.A. You got M.I.A. who is who is a known troublemaker, who you know starts shit. <laughs> and, you, and you're going to bring this person onto the most, like, American, like, game ever. Not even the NBA Finals is, like, is, as, as worshipped as the Super Bowl, as far as sports go in America. So, okay, so you have him on, you have him on the stage, blah, blah, this and that. You have Madonna come out, you have... Um, Nicki Minaj come out, M.I.A. come out. And then you had the part where the part in the M.I.A. song where she goes, I don't give a shit. And even in the video, she flicks the middle finger. Now, the thing that I'm not too sure about with this part that comes out when she flips the bird is that she flips the bird in the video. She flips the bird the same, the same time she does in the song. So it's up to the individual to decide whether she did that on purpose did Madonna know that she was going to do that and they were okay with that? Because you know how Madonna starts shit? Yeah. Or was it, it was just a heat of the moment and she got hyped and she flipped that bird because she was just into it so much. But my question would be this, and I can throw this to you. Knowing how calculated Madonna is, my guess would be Madonna was aware of what was going down. And then the chips fell where they may. Because in order for her to talk about the album, Madonna's not relevant, this and that, blah, 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 like that. So it was one of them things where it was like both of them are troublemakers and go, okay, let's throw this out there and see what happens. We're both big Madonna fans, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we kind of know that she has a history of controversy. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if the, if that was the case. You know, considering how um, Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake yeah. did did the whole nip slip thing, you know, years ago, and how infamous that was, right? I, I can't even remember what song that was that Janet Jackson <laughs> was singing. No idea. I remember her nipple. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching that live, and I remember watching this live as well. As soon as she did it, I was like, oh, God, this isn't going to end well for you, my dear Maya. <laughs> this isn't going to end well. But they kind of threw her under the bus, you know. I mean, yeah. well, that's an understatement. Yo, yeah. We don't want to go on about this too long because obviously we want to cover the album, but we do need to build up to her state of mind. So Yeah. So in America, there, there were two divergent paths. There was a group, especially I've seen it on Twitter a lot of them, a lot of them were kind of mocking, the, the they're, they're mocking other people who complained about it as Puritans. Because I come, I come from the place of, I might get in trouble for saying this one. I come from the place where the worst thing that happened that night on that stage, in that during that game, was not a middle finger that I flipped up. There was so much, like for me, I, like the end, the end of, well, I should, I'm getting in trouble now. All right, so my thing is, and like I said, this is like any, this is like any powerful organization. There's a lot of shady shit that goes down with some of this stuff. 
if you're if you if you're an adult and you think and you follow the frost all the way through, and there's certain things that they allow and they don't allow. So for me, I I kind of found it hilarious that that was considered an evil. I got why she got in trouble. There's no way she was not gonna get in trouble. There's no question about that. I was my personal side was I was just mocking the people who got all puritanical about it. But that being said, there were a lot of people that were angry about it. But then at the end of the day, after it kind of went away, nobody really remembered it. To be honest with you. Everybody kind of moved on. It's like except every once in a while, people will bring it up and like kind of like circle. But it kind of went away. It wasn't as it, it wasn't as bad as the Janet Jackson one because Janet Jackson was far more popular than, than MIA was. Mm-hmm. I remember them people getting mad about this one, but I remember the Janet Jackson one was a huge deal, bigger than this one. So I it it, it came. It was hot for like a couple, like a couple of months, and then it kind of like flew under. But every once in a while, it would pop up and then it would pop back down. That's how it was over here. Over here, we couldn't quite understand the levels of animosity towards her. Like it's it's clear that what she did was wrong because mm-hmm. you know on any live sporting thing, if you're the entertainer, you shouldn't just stick the middle finger up at the camera. But I will say this. But I will say this though. I did see a clip of Adele. She was at uh, a music awards and she flipped the bird on there, and everyone's like, "Oh yeah, Adele, she's so great for flipping the bird." Had <laughs> the thing right there. So I'm like, okay, all right. Okay, but but Adele didn't get even half the 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 vitriol that that happened right there. Not to say that the Super Bowl is so different from like an award show, but but all things considered, I mean, Adele was America was was the world's darling. So I guess they they was willing to let that slide or whatever. I mean, I think there's there's one rule for Adele and mm-hmm. there's another for MIA, but I don't think yes. it's the same situation. If MIA did that, like you know. Uh, the halftime entertainment show in the World Cup final or something like mm. that, right? It, then she would clearly get in trouble. Um, mm. Saying that, if you look at the Super Bowl ads, like I know the following year, yeah, I was watch- I was watching the Super Bowl ads with great interest, and there was I think it was Go Daddy or something like that. I can't remember. Mm. There's a guy like this nerdish guy. He comes home and he sits on his sofa, which is made up of bikini clad women. The mm-hmm. bikini clad women are the human sofa, right? Yeah. And I was like, all right, okay, MIA did a bad thing. But, <laughs> but you know, the kind of ads that do get shown uh, in the NFL, the Super Bowl, you know, it's it's pretty crazy, Incons- you know. Inconsistent. The morality is inconsistent. Yeah. And, and, but it is consistent because it's every year. That's the problem, yeah. right? It's, mm-hmm. it's questionable every year. Yeah. Even last year, you know, it's still, amidst this um, new wave of feminism, it's still there. Yeah. It's completely there. Yeah. How did that shape? Well, hang on. Bad Girls was released like a couple of days before, or a couple of days before. Be, it was released a couple of days before even the uh, Madonna video came out. Yeah, the, even the video was released, wasn't it? Oh yeah, and people had a problem with that one because they say she was appropriating, I guess, uh, drifting culture in, in, in the Middle East. They were trying to say, I guess that was that was a big one that the liberals came in on at that point. I mean, we'll, a, I guess we'll have to talk about the 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 bad girls video when we get to yeah, bad yeah, girls yeah. itself um although i was watching it just before we started this podcast and i was like oh man this is one of my favorite videos <laughs> probably of all time actually yeah mm-hmm. um but okay so super bowl crazy uh, i remember her publicist said look i think you should just leave the country so she just went and mm-hmm. basically didn't turn on her phone <laughs> which which is pretty amazing right um yeah. And how does that lead into... What else was there? What else was there before Matanga um, actually dropped? Apart from the record label, the record label drama... She, 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 thre- right? she had to threaten again to, to leak it, and then they finally gave her a date. Which is what she's now doing with... Well, what she did with AIM. This one. This one. Right? Cause this one was supposed to come out at the beginning of the summer. She said it was supposed to come out at the beginning of the summer. And then it, it came... And then, it, then, then uh, I think June came and went. And then she finally said on uh, Twitter, I want to leak it again, and then that's when she needed a date. Like sometimes I like sometimes I question that sometimes because I don't wanna, I don't want to be the conspiracy theorist guy, but I'm like cause she has to do that every time. I'm like, is this a part of marketing or is this yeah. actually a thing that's happening? And also her saying that this is my this might be my last album. You yeah. know, she did that on Maya, mm-hmm. she did that on Matangi, and now she's done yeah. it with AIM as well. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people do say that kind of thing, and it's like, yeah. okay, fine. You know, I can accept you saying it. I hope it's mm-hmm. not true. <laughs> but, but stop crying wolf now you know it's yeah. okay to say okay this is my last album on this mm-hmm. label yeah? yeah so i don't know 
That's what I'm saying. So I don't know about that sometimes when they have that thing right there. Or maybe they just weren't getting the reaction they were getting, so they pushed it forward to get that little bit of extra. But who knows? So anyway. Yeah. That leads to this album. So I, I'll start off by I'll start off with my personal thing with it. So my well, thing was... Well, hang on, hang but, on. Let me just interject there. Last point, right? Okay. Bad Girls was released in what? Like kind of February of... It was released with Vicky Leaks. It, it released on New Year's Day because it came... Well... You talk about if you talk about the actual song. No, no, no. I'm talking about the single and video, right? That was that was 2012. I think so. Yeah, it was at the beginning of 2012, right? Now, Matangi the album didn't drop until like what November the next year. Yeah, because I went to a concert when she was there. I got it the day she she. I went to the concert the day she had it. It was in it was in the fall. Are we going to talk about your story in this podcast? Uh, uh, I, I I can tell that story at the end. Or how I think, you, I, I think you should. I, I think you should. I think you should tell the story at the end. Okay, so that's the last story at the end. All right, all right. Let's get into the album then. Let's get. It. All right. So, as far as I was concerned, with the other three albums, that she kind of she kind of made her statement. And to me, when she talked about this album, Bob like that, and she said that the last album was Maya, which was her, she said which was her nickname, which the Maya word was always also the word for illusion. Kind of thing like that that goes along with the whole entire thing with the internet in America and distortion and confusion stuff like that. And then when she said that this album was Matangi, which is a play off of her name Matangi, I thought, okay, so this is kind of like going past that illusion into something else. And the fact that the name, the, the title of the name Matangi, is the goddess of the streets, goddess of music, goddess of the poor and trodden, kind of like that. So all that stuff kind of clicked. So it's kind of like where she had the first album where it was like specifically like a Sh- Sri Lanka, kind of like that area, the downtrodden. Then you go to uh, Kala, which is like her mother. And then it's kind of like more of the world. And then uh, Maya, which is like America and that social distortion and stuff like that. So I figured that at this point, and it kind of, as you go through the album, it's kind of like this album is basically like that spiritual album. She even said that leading up to it. This is going to be her spiritual album. Matter of fact, she said at some point, she was like, the album that people should like look at, like this one was uh, uh, Paul Simon's album, Graceland, which was like another spiritual world album. It was like, a, it was like one of those world albums that yeah. was kind of like a spiritual thing. And like, there's one song in here which kind of like, is kind of like the key to the, like that point that she was going to, but we'll get to that later on. But so she was kind of like, this is my Paul Simon, Graceland, world spiritual album, kind of thing like that. So, we open up with the song called Carmageddon, which, of course, the themes with Hinduism and everything like that, it goes in that thing. So, it's like that mixture of, like, karma, that spiritual, and then, like, you, you push that in with the word Armageddon, and you flatten that thing. So, it's kind of like that yin and yang thing going again, right there. Hmm. So, um, I think out of all the openings that didn't start with a song, which is, I guess, um, uh, Kala started with a song. There was no, like, opening, opening track kind of thing like that. So you have uh, Banana Skit in her first album, which is that opening, with the of education. And then in the third album, you kind of have um, uh, the message with the Google Connect to the government, blah, 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 this is like that. Um, she starts off with this kind of like, um, like, 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 like chant with that. So you automatically know that it's some kind of spiritual, spiritual like theme going on right there. And it goes into like the sinister... Bum, 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 bum. So that's already another contrast. So it was like that enlightenment and like that kind of like um, like sinister situation going on right there. Mm. Um, she said she says there's an opening ceremony and we all start to sing. She goes cells go to cell phones, some form cells, some get put in cells, and sex fucking cells. So yeah. <laughs> you already have those the plays on that 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 concept of technology and the flesh and sex and people getting put into prison. So it's kind of like they're all mixed in with the same thing. Kind of like that karma, what goes around, comes around situation right there. Um, you need new keys, the type of old deeds set up by old needs. New keys, kind of talking about, about the keyboard, the technology, type of old deeds. So even though you have these new things, it's still saying, it's still doing the old things that we do, set up by old needs. Um, what world peace, what was in what you read, what was in what you're fed, where do you get to when the internet leads? Things do change and change has a range. Um, so she goes, she's not, so she's at near the end of the song, she goes, 
I'm not Dalai Lama. She ain't Sally Baba. My world is the armor, and you're about to meet your karma. Kind of thing like that. So her weapons are, so instead of her words being a weapon, it's kind of more of like a protection. Mm. And then she's going to leave there. So because I see an annotation on here from um, Genius, where it goes, The goddess Batangi is often depicted as carrying a sword in battle to protect the promise of freedom that words possess and the intrinsic value of ideals that they contain. In that sense. So that's kind of like the opening right there. That's how I kind of looked at it a little bit. It's like that little opening where it's kind of like it's leading to. It's like telling me it's like a, it's like it's like a, it's like a half thesis because a real thesis doesn't come to the middle of the album. But this is kind of like our opening right here. This is going to be a spiritual journey rather than something like America or the world or even specifically like Sri Lanka. So that's the way I kind of came into it. I haven't got too much more to add to that. I think Arula, she was kind of repping her hood. Carla, it was kind of a more global outlook on things. Uh, Maya was really about America and the internet. And then this is definitely looking inwards, this mm-hmm. album. Um, yes. I think from the start, she also says, she also said in an interview that basically the best way to approach this album uh, is as if she's serving you lots and lots of dishes of different types of cuisine. It's a mm-hmm. really huge meal, right? Mm-hmm. Now, there are times when I don't want to eat all <laughs> <laughs> every cuisine under the sun, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I could do 10, 11 maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure about 15, right? <laughs> so at the time, I wasn't really sure about this introduction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought, I thought, yeah, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As uh, I also thought that about the next track, yeah, the first proper track on the album. Since then, it's definitely grown on me yeah. because it's the kind of. I guess I didn't realize how deep it went, to be honest. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's it's okay for me to say that. You know, I am a huge MIA fan, but I'm not going to yeah. say everything. Yeah, I'm not yeah. a complete obsessive. I don't devote my life to her, right? Oh yes. Yeah. So, you know, there are going to be things that I miss. Um, so actually, the, it's grown on me. This intro, it's mm-hmm. definitely grown on. Me. And leading into the next track. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, it's it's something I've come to love, Matangi. Mm-hmm. With the drums, right? The drums on this song really take me to a place where every year we'd, there's um, around kind of Diwali, there's this, in my community, there's something called Navrati. Okay. And you basically do like, I think it's like 10 nights of Garbas. Garba is when you do like a circular dance around um, a sort of shrine in the middle. And okay. when I say you, I mean like, like a thousand people okay. in in a big hall kind of thing. And you've got the drummers going and you've got the guys playing the pipes, you've got the keyboard, you've got this, that, and it gets progressively quicker as well. So by the end, you're, you're just bombing it around and stuff, right? And this took me instantly to that. So I instantly got it. I didn't even need any kind of explanation. I don't need Rap Genius on this. So I instinctively got it being Hindu myself. Yeah. It took me a while to like this song. Yeah. Again, like 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 how I didn't like stepping up that much, like, how, or rather how I didn't love it. It took mm-hmm. me a while to like this one as well. Yeah. Now uh, I'm obsessed with it. It's a brilliant. Yeah. Track. Uh, but it definitely took a while. How about you? All right. So going back to the theme of the album, there's there's there's, there's a structure this album's going to go to, which I'm going to kind of like lead up to. Okay. So if this is the album, she said when she first made this album, the other thing she said, she was like. This album is going to be part. Part of the album is it's going to take it's, it's going to take all three of the other albums and, and and pack it into this one album. So it's kind of like the ultimate, like the ultimate thesis where where all three albums are separated. This is the album where she kind of like joins them together, like Voltron in a way. So the fact that she starts off with all the the, the shout outs like Somalia, Bosnia, Cuba, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Bhutan, Morocco. So basically, right now she's saying, okay. My manifesto the whole time throughout my career of music was about this whole ideal of multiculturalism. The whole thing with Matangi. So it's not so she's being specific about what kind of multiculturalism she's talking about. She's talking about the street people, she's talking about the people who are downtrodden, who are poor, and it's not just in one area. It's not just in third world countries, it's not just in in, in first world countries. It's like that whole connection. And the and the thing that she's singing about that I think people missed when she was talking about the whole Black Lives Matter thing recently, but we'll talk about that later. Um, it's kind of like that thing where I'm I, I, I'm not representing everybody, but she's speaking for everybody because even at because even at the point she's still talking about it like she goes um 
uh, later on she goes, uh, I preach like a priest and I sing like a whore. Yeah. Kind of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So it's that kind of things. Like, I'll say, I, I, I got that, 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 that preachy, preachy side, but I also got that part where I'm like that trickster in a kind of way. So I'm like, I kind of have that balance. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the good girl. I, I, I have goodness in me, but I also have that, that other side of me, which, which is going to play into bad girls later on. Can I interject on that whore point quickly? Right. I have um, second cousins, yeah, that came over from India in the early 90s. And basically, their parents, even like 20, 25 years later, they still associated uh, Indian girls that sang or danced with whores. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't good to be in the music industry. It, and they wouldn't let their daughter dance, let alone sing, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. So, and this is in the UK. They'd come from India to the UK. So when she says, I sing like a whore, I was like, I get that. Yeah. Okay. So that for me was a lot more direct. Yeah. I'm sure that people have slung shit at her saying you preach too much. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, especially the kind of Indian, maybe Arabic side, like, the, you just think she's a whore, basically. Yes. It's that simple, that element. Sorry. Anyway, you okay. go. So my favorite line in this song, which kind of leads into one of the songs later on, is uh, when she goes, they make big sounds with nothing to say. She does the same thing with that part. That, that I, I go to the second part of it. She does the same thing with that line that she does with the uh, love a lot. Where she goes, I really love a lot. But the way she says it, it sounds like, I really love a lot. It's the, the, the lyrics are technically, they make big sounds with nothing to say. But the way she says it, and it sounds like, they make big sounds but not NSA. I don't get it. But you don't get it, NSA? They make big sounds. Oh. NSA. NSA. Uh-huh. Yeah, they make big sounds, but not NSA. Wait, I, got, just... I, I got the line earlier about the sorbet yeah. one. Because the way yeah. she says sorbet. Um, so ice cream, you're so bae. Yeah. She they says so guns, but... bait because, the, because saying someone is bait. Yeah, so bae, yeah. slang, right? Yeah. So that yeah, was a pl- then... I didn't get the NSA one. Uh-huh. Yeah, but they make big sounds, but not so NSA. There you go. So that's the always time. That's all, the first time I heard that. The first time I heard that part because even before I looked at the lyrics, I thought she was saying they make big sound, but not NSA. But then I looked at it. I was like, okay, she did that shit again, basically, kind of thing like that. So okay, um, she has the whole thing with Drake or whatever, but that's not part. And the 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 part that I, I really enjoyed, besides the the main part where she starts off with that that one beat and she switches the beats up with the verses, and then she does that final outro thing where yeah. like that. It's kind of like that drum. She goes, bop, 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 bop. All right, so I, I just enjoyed the whole entire thing. So for me, this song already like got me. The first time I heard it, I was like, holy shit. I was like, here we go. Kind of situation like that. So I guess we could, I guess we said as much as we can't say it on that one. So that one, the, unless you have something else you want to add. Well, I guess my problem with the first two tracks together combined, right, is that I think there's a song coming up which should have opened the album. But right, we'll get so, to that. We'll get to yeah, that. we'll get to that one. There's gonna be a debate on that one. All yeah. right, so we go to that one to only one you. Now I said before in the other um, the other uh, podcast, I think it was Pike Kala, like this. I have three favorite songs of hers. This is well, this is number three. It's tied with another song, so it's technically four. But this one is tied with another song. So this is like part one of my of my favorite three songs. Wow. Um, so you got that one. So you're talking about with the with with with, with the. So the first thing I realized was um, talking about the bells because I know that bells are very like from what from from being an outsider looking into Hinduism. Um, the first thing that caught me was the bells, and I looked something up, and I don't know if you helped me out with this one, um, with the bells and like the ding 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 ding. So I I found out the song. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. Uh, Aganta, you know what that is, right? Ritual bell. Well, yeah, like my parents, every morning they go down and um, they've got a little mandir like in the kitchen mm-hmm. and they'll do a little prayer. And my mum especially, she's got a little bell that she goes, that goes ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah, that's exactly what my mum does. So I got it as soon as as soon as she said it. I mean, yeah. I, the way that MIA says it, there's a few different ways, right? So yeah. it's it's that kind of ritualistic bell. It's also ding ding. The Rocky ding. Bell, the Rocky Bell. I yeah, mean, it's, it's, it's boxing match bell. Two levels, like yeah. that Bucky Dung Gun kind of situation, like the Rocky. Yeah, bell. exactly. So I looked at it, and then um, in Hinduism, the mantra chanted while ringing the bell is, and I can't say the uh, the thing, but I can read the translation. I ring this bell, indicating the invocation of divinity. 
so that the virtuous and noble forces enter and the demonic and evil forces from within and without depart. Um, so then you go back to the opening lyrics and um, she goes, just because the game is up, doesn't, just because the game is up doesn't mean I didn't win. So I personally took that and maybe you can come another way with it. I personally took it as like, like as far as her career in the industry, whether how, how the game you play it, just because the game is up or whatever, how they look at her and they say she's not going to be at that point or whatever, didn't mean I didn't win. I got three aces and a king. So for me, I took the three aces as her first three albums. And I took the king for this album. So, she, and then she goes right there. Um, you, might have, you might have gotten love from unnatural things. That's why my instincts kicks in. It doesn't matter if you win, it's based on what you bring. Kind of thing like that. She goes, your telephone rings, but you ain't listening. So motherfucker, now I'm stepping in. So I kind of went back to that whole entire mantra of like, like clearing those those demonic evil forces out from you from within within without. And she's kind of like going to be the person, kind of like like kind of like Matangi to come in and, and try to clear that shit out of you in a way. They kind of tell you like you're the person because the whole the whole course is just only one you and only you can do that kind of. It's like it's like it's like the end like an individual an individualistic battle cry. It's kind of like. So in comparison, like like the relationship between that and the opening song, where it's like she's talking about the whole entire world, blah blah blah. She brings it back down to being very specific at this point. I'm like you got the whole world, you got all these different countries, this and that, like that. But let's start with you. Let's build it up for the like from the cellular level. You build it up from that point right there. So yeah. She kind of starts up. Okay, so I'm giving you the overview. This is Matangi. This is what I've been talking about the whole career. So let's take it back to just starting with you and what you have to do, and what you're going to say. So when her second verse comes up. She talks about herself being an individual, talking about Laura Croft is soft. When it comes to my stuff, she's made up, I'm real, stuff like that. So in a way, she's like, she's bigging herself up. At the same time, she's telling you, as I'm bigging myself up, you can kind of big yourself up. Because she goes, at the after the hook, she goes, there's trillions of cash and there's billions of us. And there's millions of things that can happen with the stuff. And there's thousands that will crash. And there's hundreds that will smash. There's only one you and I'm, I'm going to drink to that. So it's kind of like in a way where even though she's your, even though she's trying to inspire people, at the end of the day, the thing that she's really happy about and the thing she really wants to celebrate is you, in a sense. So she goes, come on, let's go, let's go take off. Which this, I believe this end, this end lyrics are going to lead into the next song. She goes, come on, let's go, let's go take off. Because the nice to one, because tomorrow will never come. Working all day and night is going to be mine. Making money is fine, but your life is one of a kind. It kind of goes back to that thing with her, the, all the other three other albums where it's like, it's always that thing where she's like, it's always money versus people. Kind of situation. So yeah. I was like, okay, money is okay. But your life is one of the kind. So she kind of brought back that money versus people ideal from Kala back into this around right there. That's what I got from it right there. I think there's a restlessness on this album. You can mm-hmm. tell that that she really wants to bring pure creativity to it. Mm-hmm. Right? And okay, obviously she does sample things and stuff like that. And you can say on a base level, no, it's not purely creative. She hasn't invented every single thing. But, or, you know, no mm-hmm. idea is original. Everything, no, exactly. Yeah. Everything it's builds how, on something, right? It's how to utilize it. Yeah. No. So all you can do is tap into that kind of universal energy, that life source, right? And try yes. to just let it flow through you so mm-hmm. that you can attempt to create something truly original, right? Yes. Or at the very least, not you know not be obsessed with what's around you and jump on trends because that's what tend to uh, it tends to happen that way in the music industry right yes like i read some amazing tweet i think it was about like house music that you know two guys will do something amazing and then like the next 98 will just copy it and that's how, <laughs> how like trends it. and i was like yeah that's so true it's just so true and i think that's what she's trying to get away from on this album and on this song and particularly the next song actually yeah as, um, yeah as as a one two for yeah, like only one you is an incredible song. It's like, yes, it's almost like a palate cleanser at the beginning of the meal, right? Mm-hmm. And then we go into Warriors, yes, which is one of the hardest beats I have ever heard <laughs> in my life. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm talking any rapper ever. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you take Biggie, you put him over Warriors. You take uh-huh. Method Man, you take whoever, yeah. Uh-huh. Let let's see how they go over Warriors. Woo. The beat is just so wow, yeah. Yes, I don't know. Like this song just does things to me. It's just crazy, okay. absolutely crazy. Well, I love the song. It's amazing this song, and and I think at this stage in the album, I'm kind of like, 
I have to admit, before Matangi came out, I wasn't expecting much. Okay. Right? And this is exactly my attitude with AIM as well. I'm not expecting much. I don't I don't want to build up the hype too much mm-hmm. and I don't want to but once like only one you and Warriors came, I was like Yeah. This album is already surpassing my expectations. I was I was reading about Warriors about the way that she made it, right? Did you hear mm-hmm. about that? No. It was just I think it was hang on, is it Warriors or was it um only one you? One of them basically they crashed a car and stuff like that. <laughs> and they were they were literally sampling the crashing of the car as they crash the car because they've been drinking and stuff like that. Yeah. I think it was only one you actually. So it, it's, it's, there's like a reverse bass line in it and stuff and it's just, mm. cr- it's amazing. It's really... That's what I'm saying. Crazy. You barely, yeah. people barely, I mean, we're barely sc- scraping the surface. That's why yeah. I have no, d- yeah. that's why yeah. I have no doubt about it. Like, I don't think, for me personally, like I know, like you said, no going to expect nothing. Like I, but but my experience with her, from when I listen to her, I don't think she puts out albums just for, for, the, for the fuck of it. I, I believe I that much I do believe that part I do believe I believe mm-hmm. she wouldn't I, I believe she's the type that wouldn't put out an album unless she was satisfied with the end result for whatever reason kind of situation and she defends Amaya to this day she was like people she's like she's like she's like I'm proud of Amaya so she's kind of like that kind of thing she's like I knew exactly what I wanted to do and what I'm going for and like I and like I said I mean, we can talk about like ideals about aim at the end but um but yeah so when I when I heard Warriors like I said, I was already, I was already good. When I when I heard um, Karma get it, I was like, okay, I'm I'm, I'm easing up to it. This is the opening song, blah blah this and that. But Tangi was like, yes, 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 I love this one. Like if I if I was to give him like numbers, I would give like Warriors like for amped up. I was like, okay, it was it was, it was like a solid seven. And then Matangi was like, okay, it was an eight. And then only one you was my first ten. And then I went to Warriors, and Warriors be, it was like my eight point five veering towards a nine. And when she when she first says I tick 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 I collect all my ticks I already knew she was talking about a bomb right off the interest. I was like, who opens up an album like that? And that's going back to her doing that 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna be controversial but not be really controversial shit. Because she's going back to that thing where they call her a terrorist and that's like I tick 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 I collect all my ticks. It's like that bomb imagery popping up right again. And you talk about warriors right there. It's kind of like this whole album is like her gathering people up. Where it's like you come from only one you. She break it down to the cellular thing, and now you're gathering all these people around with this little chant, kind of thing like that. And it, it, if anything, it kind of refers back to um, Carmageddon because this one starts with the same chant once again, kind of situation. Mm-hmm. Like at this point, you try, you try to bring out this thing right here, um, gangster bangers, or put them in a trance, or put them in a trance, kind of situation. One snare, one kick. Oh, look at this, where she's like, she knows that beat is this shit. So she's <laughs> like that, and then once, and then when she's, and then it's funny thing about that part is she says one snare, one kick. Oh, look at this! And then as she says that, the beat drops, and it goes na na na. You know what I'm trying to say? She's like, I know my shit is hot, and then it goes right into that kind of thing right there. Um, it's kind of like it's like it's like a tri- it's like a it's like a it's like a tribal trend. And then the funny thing about it, M I A, Mudra Middle Finger, when she started making a little joke at the um. Super at, the, at the, her middle finger right there, talking about because it's, it's a spiritual thing, but it's also like Super Bowl situation. Fuck the mother bitches that try to be my ringer. <laughs> so she's she's coming at whoever she thinks is trying to copy her, her style or whatever like that. Yeah. Uh, and then here's another another karma situation. This time I this time I come as singer. Next time I'll come as pain. That kind of situation. Uh, bitches <laughs> try to get at me with their witches, Uncle Kane. They just turn to dust, and I wash them down the drain. <laughs> Vitamins for your brain, protein for your weight gain. Warriors in the dance is how we train. So you like you brush off them, them motherfuckers that are coming at you, but at the same time you're still you're still continuing that thing of like bringing that spirituality into it, even in spite of all these people coming at you. Sometimes you got to knock them in their fucking mouths, but even even if you do that, I still got I, I still I, I still got my my center right there, kind of situation. I think this is my favorite song on the album. Oh yeah! If you if you remove "Bad Girls" and just treat it as like a single that was released two years prior, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is probably my favorite song on the album. Oh yeah! Cool. Yeah, it's just so hard. Like you know, I think Hit Boy did an amazing job, and I think mm. he was free freed up to be like genuinely creative by MIA, uh-huh. and the lyrics on it are just so badass it's like yeah. like like you said you know that kind of thing even like the you know fuck the mother bitches they try to yeah. get my ringer yeah right like 
around the time there was there was this kind of really I don't want to be disrespectful, but like quite a minor league kind of Asian artist. I think she's Canadian called Anjuli, and yeah. like she released a couple of things, and I sort of reviewed reviewed them on my own website, and uh-huh. um, and then I I must have completely missed this one because she completely ripped off MIA <laughs> Circa Carla in one of her videos, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. And uh, if you see it, I was, and then I ended up watching it like last week after in preparation for this, I was like, man, this is yeah. crazy. This is just the most blatant ripping off, right? Mm-hmm. And Rihanna did it with the Bad Girls video. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, not Bad Girls. Rihanna did it with the uh, Rude Boy video. Yeah. Oh, Rude Boy, Rude Boy. Yeah. Yeah, that video, she completely rips off uh, boys, MIA uh-huh. boys, right? <laughs> so uh, that's not to say MIA doesn't sample from other people because she does. Yeah. Mm. Or that she's purely creative all the time, but she definitely fights for her her uniqueness. You know? Voice, yeah, her voice, yeah, yeah. Her voice um, distinctive. Her voice, okay, because like you're saying, in spite of all the influences that come on, she's like, it, it goes back to what I was saying about this this guy named Hideo Kojima. Like he has all these film influences, but even though you could tell his influences, he has a specific voice. The same thing, Emma. You can see the influences that's coming from her, but because she is such a singular person, she makes those. She, she acknowledges that these influence her, but she has her own voice at the same time. When you hear an M.I.A. track, you know that's M.I.A. Even mm-hmm. with her voice. No matter what sounds behind her, when you hear that track, I, I will say this. I never got how people say she sounds like Santy Gold. I don't understand that one. Maybe, or maybe you feel or maybe you feel like those people do. No, no. I, th- I, I think Santy Gold did a couple of tracks where she was almost deliberately trying to be like M.I.A. Because... Uh-huh. Especially at the beginning, Santa Girl was quite the mimic, I have to say. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing her at the Carla concert in like 2007, 2008, because she okay. opened up and she was amazing, absolutely yeah. brilliant in terms of the performance that she put on. Yeah. And then her album came out and stuff. But her album, I mean, she she's, she's not just a mimic. She's very talented, yeah. Yeah. right? But she she doesn't have like a singular voice at all. You know, okay. She's not that person. On on her album, she had twelve songs, and almost everyone was completely different, right? Mm-hmm. As if she were role playing. So for her to do a song like Creator, clearly that's role playing as MIA. Gotcha. Yeah. That's interesting. I agree there's with that. One. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but it's not. That's not backwards compatible. You can't say MIA sounds like Santa Gold because it's just not true. No, that's not true at all. Man. Um, that's not at all. So, like, no. not, not not to say that Santa Gold's not great in her own right. She is, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. That's no, not no, no. Santa Gold's cool. Santa Gold's yeah, cool. Definitely. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we're gonna move on to "Come Walk with Me." I'll let you start this one off. This is the song that should have started the album. You think so? I know so. <laughs> <laughs> If you're talking about forget conceptually, forget thematically, forget okay. about hin- forget about Hinduism, and okay. I realize I am Hindu, I'm now a bad Hindu for saying that, but yeah. forget about all that. Come walk yeah. with me. The way that it starts, the way that it builds, the chorus, that the ending of it, when she starts saying, am I a coming back with power, power again? I'm sure, yeah, I am absolutely sure <laughs> that this this was supposed to start the album. Yeah, and then her, and this is the kind of song that her label said, no, this album is too happy. This doesn't represent who you are. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, t- I don't know. T- to me, this this song was probably the one that was going to start the album and then whatever, whatever changed. And then she ended up coming up with an intro with mm-hmm. uh, Carmageddon. And actually, mm-hmm. she said that there was another track that her and Switch put together called Saturday or Saturdays or something. Uh, like. That's going to be on That's going to be on AIM. Is it? Yes, it's going to be on AIM. Because she, yes. she said that the drums on that were even crazier than Carmageddon. And by the sound of it, she was kind of like, she seemed to like it more than Carmageddon. Mm-hmm. But there was a mess up and they missed a the deadline. They couldn't talk because she didn't have an internet connection. She couldn't talk to Switch. He didn't submit it, stuff like that. So, Like, for example, I read that Lights on this album was supposed to be on um, uh, Maya. But it didn't fit there, so it got put on here. Like, there's I, this... I, I, didn't, I didn't read that. I read something contrary about Lights, actually. What'd you say? What'd you read? Oh, we'll get to that part. We'll get to okay, that. Okay. We'll get to that. All right, part. we'll save that. We'll save that, yeah. All right, okay, so continue. So Come Walk With Me, I love this song. The, just mm-hmm. the the intro, the chords to it, and the sentiment of it is almost kind of like one of these old-school love songs, really. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? And yet it has that kind of 
when the, when the beat drops and it goes all crazy and it's like a like 150 million beats per minute kind of thing yeah. and i don't know i just it's it's the kind of track that brings us all together from the start yes uh, mm-hmm. but basically when i ended up re-editing this into my own matangi playlist mm-hmm. yeah this is the song that opened up the album and for me it worked a lot better okay. than the the what do you call it the intro Carmageddon. and gotcha. yeah carmageddon and matangi for mm. me this worked a lot better gotcha so how do you feel about this song all right so so you know how i said that there was a tie with um with only one you for my third favorite mia song this is the tie right here wow yes so this is the second this is the second 10 on this album so my thing with this i feel like this is the sequel to only one you once you got her warriors gathered and it comes out to me it works well on the spot because now that she got her people together and she got all that haters off her fucking back and this and that. And this is where it's pure love and joy at this point right here. Everybody's got who they are. Everybody's ready to go against those people who are ready to fuck around with them. But even if they fuck around with you, we're good. And then it's the point where she's like, everybody just fucking gather around and let's just do this kind of thing, kind of situation. I mean, I don't want to overanalyze this, this one too much because I think the, the, the whole point of the song is just, just pure communal joy right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Kind of thing like that. Um, what doesn't kill us make us stronger. That's why my nose get longer and longer. I read somebody, they were analyzing the lyrics of the song. And they're like, they were, it was cheesy. I'm like, and then I wanted to say to that person, I'm like, that's kind of the point. It's like that pure euphoria. It's not even, it's not about being, now, now going back to what you said about the studio saying like, this was like, this shouldn't be her. Like, that's the point of the fucking album. If you're talking about spirituality, this is why I have a problem with, um, with with labels like Interscope, they fuck up people's albums a lot. Sometimes I'm like, why? Yeah, how do they you, do. They really they, they fucked up. They, they fucked up Slaughterhouse. I'm like, how do you fuck up Slaughterhouse? But that's another story for another day. But um, so when I hear stuff like this, like this fits within the context of the album, and I can imagine they're sitting there like, you motherfuckers don't understand the artistic value of this song. It's like it's like, do you want me? To, so you want me to be? You want me to be the the the, the angry troublemaker every time? That's not what I. What, what I what I am all the time kind of thing. They want like another board free or something like that. Like it's not gonna be like that. So this song fits this album perfectly. Um, I won't argue your your thing with the opening because if it works for you, then it works. You know what I'm trying to say I can argue that one. But for me, I think it was perfectly placed right here. But but I also think this is one of the best songs she ever written right here. So that's how I feel about it. I, I don't I don't feel it sticks in the album. I don't think I don't think it as the fifth place track it works. I don't think it follows on from uh, from Warriors well at all actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, don't know. Just just the way it segues from Warriors to this, it just it, uh, I don't know. There's something it just doesn't <laughs> it quite. Does, it, it, doesn't, it just it doesn't, doesn't quite too. fit. Yeah, it just doesn't gotcha. quite fit. I don't. Uh, yeah, know. I'm the opposite. It works right there because it yeah. goes. It, 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 she she does that. She does that stop, and you're like, okay, what's going to happen next? It's like it's like a plot twist. It's like okay, yeah. so you're ready for it. So, so now you're ready to fuck shit up. And then she kind of throws you a fucking curveball. Or here is this bling, 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 bling. And you're like, what the fuck? It's like, so now she's, so she was like, this is how we train, this and this. And she got her warriors ready. And then she comes with this. There's a thousand ways to track us down. I think it's like a nice curveball. Because it goes back to the, um, it goes back to her when she was talking about the, um, the, uh, Paul Simon feel of it. Because I listened to some tracks from that, from the, um, from the, uh, from the Graceland album, and it's very warm, and it's very inviting, and it's very this and very that, so I think it kind of goes, and she said that was what she was going for, so it's kind of like you have that, the hectic shit kind of in the, because there's going to be, there's going to be a stream of songs that are relatively lighter in them, like for the next three songs, and then it comes right back out after Boom Ad, it goes right back into the harshness, so kind of like, this is kind of like the introduction to kind of like that, that laid back feel, where it was like, kind of similar to where Love A Lot, you had that love a lot, story to be told, it takes a muscle, it is what it is kind of like feel in the middle, kind of like that. I was like, so now we got the heavy stuff out the way. Now we got that harsh, kind of like aggressive thing for this album in particular in particular. Not like a like a like a like a Maya harsh. It's harsh for this album relatively. And then you kind of go out into that. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna sit here and relax for a little bit. Even even though the song is like hectic and energetic, it kinda of like leads into the next song. It still has that kind of like like that love, peace and hope kind of feel. Kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. There, there are two other things that I wanted to quickly mention on this. Song. Mm-hmm. One, one is uh, when she says it's cool. It takes two. Yes. Right. Which 
it was uh, for me it was quite a clear allusion to uh it takes two it takes two to make a yeah exactly right. yeah right. and even says when someone makes you feel all right so she says within like a few lines it yeah. takes two makes you feel all right yeah yes. so it is that kind of which is one of the most joyous songs ever right you yes. know exactly. and the other thing is is um when there's that kind of that vocal sample it almost sounds like a one of those old school sat navs which you know it says almost there yeah exactly and i think she explained it like saying look if you think of maya as kind of going through a tunnel to get to your destination yeah then matangi is when you park up and you're at your destination this is where you're supposed to be and like so when you when you're like the almost there bit is like you're almost there you're almost just parking up and then yes. this is when it all kind of kicks off properly you know it's the epilogue to the trilogy exactly yeah so um i i like those two bits you know i love yes. the song it's a, it's a classic it's yeah, a classic it's my, it's my it's my second 10 so we're gonna go to so so wait 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 okay so you've got come walk with me and you've got only one you okay that's tied for number three my favorite i my now so, now are one and two things that we've already covered one we already covered which was was hustle Oh, okay yeah, yeah that's right. uh, okay one one and two one and two flip flop depending on my mood so, at any given time, Hustle could be number one, and then the next song could be number one. Those flip-flop, depending on my mood, kind of situation. So, we're still going to wait for number two? Yeah, it's still here. Ah, it's, it's, it's near the Wow. Near the, yeah, exactly. So, okay. Okay, here, here's the thing about that song. Oh, well, when we get to the song, you'll, you'll see why. Because you'll see. We'll keep going. All right, so, we're going to go next to Attention. This song does things to me <laughs> <laughs> the the bass line on this song the breakdown yeah is, <laughs> is one of the sickest breakdowns i've yes. ever heard in my mm-hmm. life yes yeah um i think initially it took me a while to get used to the verses the way that the kind of the the, the auto tune thing yeah. flips right mm-hmm. um it, it's initially a bit annoying a bit jarring and stuff like like mm-hmm. frequently it is with mia but then it just grows right exactly but then, but then once once that breakdown goes there doom, 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 and it's yes. just like oh mm-hmm. it's it, it takes me back to kind of like 97 98 that arm yeah, van helden era and stuff of like that speed garage or that house era oh man it's just yes crazy it's i just didn't expect anything like that you know it's upbeat, but it's also soothing. Yeah. Even even though the lyrics are talking about, because to me, I call this hustle part two right here, because continuing that that refugee that refugee plot kind of situation. This is like another thing with the whole entire thing with the tent, this and that. I can imagine those 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 people who were in that that barrel in hustle. They arrived somewhere and they started making these tents out of like like you said the curtains. She's making it kind of situation right there. It's kind of like them, kind of like this is the continuation of their story in a way kind of situation um my existence is militant i mean there's nothing to, like the song speaks for itself in a way so there's not much to really analyze like the deeper meaning and shit because it, it like the the song specifically tells you what it is when you yeah. listen to it like it's the whole entire thing with the tent and everything rhyming with it um a couple of things that i want to the, uh, there's a couple of lyrics that i love in it the first one is the 36 chambers of my Wu tent i love that one that one is hilarious that cracks me up um um, the other one is uh, uh, things fall on our heads like we're new tent, so don't drop that ball on that butt tent. We're aliens, but we're not mutant. We're ten out of ten. I count ten. I like that. He, like nobody, like average person. Would, if, you, if if the average person did that lyric, you're like that's that's corny as fuck. But the way she delivers it, and you know she has that tongue and cheek kind of thing. It's yeah. like she does two. It's like she does two things at the same time. Like she's tongue and cheek about it, but she's also serious about it. And that's the thing that makes it work because any other person would have been like, would have been like, would have been super self serious, and that would have been like, okay, this is corny. But the fact that she does it, and she does it with that tongue in cheek kind of thing, and the line that goes, while you dance in your labu tent, we be making tent after cur tent, anybody else, that would have been whack. But because she has that flow and she has that character, she makes that work, and that thing works. Those, those two lines work incredibly well right there. And even the thing with that, with, with the, with the attention, that Bone Crusher uh, um, sample, it's, it's like, this is great. We live in distant, we live with distant to present tent for attention about my tent. I just love it right there. 
there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of a threat on this song. There's quite a threat on this song. Yeah. You know, like running through the streets causing tension. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the Le Boutent one, right? Yeah. Those those lines are quite threatening. They're kinda of like, right. listen, we'll come take your shit, yeah. <laughs> but then immediately after those two separate lines, the hook comes in and it's like doo, 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 and the vocal has ah, and then mm-hmm. it's all happy again. So it's mm-hmm. like, listen, we'll take your shit, but for now I'ma let you just ride this out, you know? Yeah. And then you know the whole story about how the lyrics came about on this? Yeah, with uh, what's what's her name? She was with Julian Assange. Yeah. Assange was helping the lyrics here. So, right there. so if the listeners don't know, apparently he came into the studio and then she was having trouble writing the lyrics, uh-huh. and he basically came up with a list of every word ever that rhymes with tent and yeah. gave it to her. And then after yeah. that, she finished it super quick. Yeah. So that that's a funny little story. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It's pretty oh, yeah. amazing. So yeah, yeah. Because I remember, her, I remember her showing footage when she went when he was when he's holed up in that place. Um, and she went and she went there with him. She went there to visit him when he was in house arrest or whatever like I, that. I never, I never saw that. So. Oh yeah, she had she had all these different Vine clips of her going there, kind of right. thing like that. So there you go. All right, so we go from that one to Exodus. Now I'll let you start with this one. Um, are you going to say that this is your favorite song? No, uh, okay. but I will say, but I will say the thesis of. This album is in this song. Yeah. Now, for me, there's two issues with this song, right? Okay. First of all, it's the whole Exodus, Sexodus thing, right? Yeah. When when it comes back at the end in yes. exactly the same form, except the beat's a bit different, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Now, for me, that dragged the steam out of the album because you got attention right before that, right? Mm-hmm. And say if we were talking about you know the whole analogy that she was making towards having a meal and you got all these different types of cuisines and courses and stuff like that for me going from attention to exodus did not work oh no no it didn't work one bit for me okay. yeah i didn't i didn't need a breather after exodus i needed it's fine to slow the tempo but mm-hmm. you can slow the tempo to with bad girls right mm. for me exodus didn't really work it's more of an end of the end of the album kind of track you know last mm. couple of songs on the track um i know that she she sort of sampled the weekend on this yeah. and she mm. presented the song to madonna for yes. madonna's album madonna said mm. no um i realized that thematically and lyrically it is the key to the album yes but i've tried to like this song <laughs> <laughs> I have tried. I've really tried, right? It doesn't work for you. But for me, it's like a sort of. I don't know. It's a a bummer. It's it's like a six out of ten kind of thing. It's like it's fine. Yeah. Ironically, I think this is probably leading up to AIM or this kind of vibe. Yes. Right, because even with borders, that kind of thing reminded me of this song actually. Yes. But in a positive way. So, I just don't think this was right the right move but i am happy to be told otherwise nah i lo- love this song this is like an 8.5 right here for me because that baby you can have it all tell me what for is the is is not i feel like this is not only the statement for this album but it's basically the statement for all four albums up to this point because i think there's a very specific reason why sex it is it's kind of like the, it's, it's kind of like if you have a trilogy and this and this is the and this is the uh this whole album is the um, uh, epilogue. Then Sexodus is the closing, the closing credits, the refrain kind of situation. Because even with the helicopter kind of flying off kind of situation, kind of thing like that. So even if she didn't make aim, then it's kind of like she, she did what she needed to do and kind of flew. Because that whole helicopter sound comes comes back or whatever like that. But for me, I like it when she slows the shit down to like to a crawl to me. Like to me, this is like the. Um, this is like the this is like what I felt that it take a muscle should have been, but it didn't have the balls to be, kind of thing, kind of situation where it's kind of like it takes a muscle to try to slow the album down, but because it was so damn slight, it's, it it worked in a way, but it didn't work. But this one, I guess maybe because I maybe because I liked the sample so much, I was okay with it. Because to me, I felt like I felt like "Come Walk with Me" was was heavy, but it, it was a light song, but it was heavy. The attention came out. It was a light song, but it was kind of heavy, but not as heavy as that one. And then she kind of like slowed it down, slowed down your heart rate to kind of be like that. Now I'll, I'll I'll defend your argument where if you're still in that mode and you want to keep going, 
then I understand that. But I I personally think that it fits the album because I think it's the I think it's the heart of the album because it, it states the 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 um the um the the whole the, it, it, the theme of the album is right here, pretty much the Exodus. What do you what are you leaving from? You're leaving from all that negativity and all that stuff from the physical world and you're transcending that and going to another spot. So when she says, if you get all this stuff, what are you doing it for? What are you really doing it for? You know what I'm saying? She's not telling you what to do with it. She's telling me, so once you get all this shit, what are you going to do with it? Kind of situation. So, I mean, that's how it worked for me. But I can't, I'm not going to argue your six at all. Because you, you made I mean, it. You there, made there, it. There, there are a lot of great lines on this song. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. there's even a line that really pisses me off because it's so accurate. Yeah. That when, she, when she says, you can drink a mint tea by the Red Sea as you're living out whose fantasy, right? Yeah. And I was like, Damn. <laughs> I was like, I really wanted to go to the Red Sea, actually, and now you just killed it to me. <laughs> if I ever go there, I'm going to be sitting there thinking, oh, God, you know, I'm such a corny motherfucker. What, yeah. Am I this for me? Yeah. But it, it's that go. good a line. It's that good a line that I'm like, it actually annoys me, I have to say. Um, but I think there are a lot of great lines in this, and you're right. I think this is the kind of centerpiece of the album, which is why it annoys me even more that Sexodus comes up at the end. Because I'm like, ref- if, you, if you're going to have a centerpiece, yeah, I don't want a refrain. I want that to be just that moment, and I want that to have the gotcha. ultimate importance, yeah. right? I don't need a refrain of it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, on that point, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer Exodus or Sexodus? They work. I see. This is the comment. You, you, you got to choose one. You got to choose one. I had to. I have to say this one because this this one is within the album. The other one is closing credits, which I'm fine with. So I would say I would go for this one. Right. Here. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So so on that eleven track uh, edit that I made uh-huh. you know, within the playlist, this does make it. It just mm-hmm. it's just like the penultimate track for me. Gotcha. <laughs> Live fast, die young, bad girls, do it well. So I know this is one of your favorite songs, so let you start off with this one. This is this is one of my favorite songs from MIA ever. Mm-hmm. I haven't got like a, a top three stroke four mm-hmm. like you have, because yeah. I haven't really mm-hmm. thought about it. Yeah. But I, I can understand why if you're kind of looking at the deeper levels of stuff, mm-hmm. um, this isn't necessarily that. Even though yeah. it, it, even though it definitely works on a dual lyrical basis, as most yeah. of her songs do, mm-hmm. and I think I even alluded to it last time on on the Maya podcast about how it's kind of, how I took it to be kind of how women aren't allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia, that kind of mm-hmm. stuff, right? Um, but the beat is just sick. The yes. video is one of my favorite videos by any artist ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, when I'm driving, this is probably one of my favorite songs <laughs> gotcha. by anyone ever. Forget forget one of my favorite MIA songs. This is one of my favorite songs to drive. Ever. To. That's cool. Ever. Yeah. It, it's just so cheeky. It's so funny. Mm-hmm. The delivery's perfect. Uh, she's so hot in the video. Yeah. She's in, in, the, in the video as well. I mean, she's even like, you know, she's like sitting and lying down on the edge of a car that's kind of like a <laughs> two-wheeled, she's like, angled thing, right? And she's actually doing it. Yeah, I was reading the interview. I was like, "Yeah, that's got to be like a CGI thing." No, nice. she actually does it. Oh my! Like, oh man! Like uh, you know, you would not see rappers doing that. Oh like no. a lot, most rappers, you just wouldn't. You know, I don't know. No. So, yeah, I mean, this song definitely one of my favorites of all time from gotcha. MA for sure. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. For, so for me, there, there, there's two parts to it. This this song normally, like when I first heard the album, I love the song. Don't get me wrong. But I, I'll say two things about the song. Like I, I give the score right for me, it's an eight. It's an eight, eight point five. Depending on my mood, it's a nine. So it's like between eight and nine for me. But for me, when I first heard it, there, I slightly prefer the "Bad Girls" on Vicky Leaks more because th- there's more production touches on this one. But the one on Vicky Leaks is even more raw. The production on that one is raw. So it's, it's, it's like that. She's kind of even more guttural on the on the Vicky Leaks one. By no means this this version not bad at all. It's still the same. I still give it the same score, but I give like a little bit of a touch to the Vicky Leaks version because of the what to call it. Um, the second thing about it is because it's so close to Double Trouble. I I, I normally I would have took it out. I would as much as I love the song. 
I would have taken it out. I was taking it out the album, but because it's close to Double Trouble and that's and this, the themes are kind of similar, I was like, okay, so that gave it the ability to be on this album because the production on that song is so left field to everything else on this album that it, it, it slightly sticks out a little bit, but because it's close to Double Trouble and because Exodus kind of had more of a streamlined kind of like production thing, that after a while, like because I first heard the album. I was kind of like, I love this song. I love it. The video is probably like my favorite, my favorite MIA out video of all time. But I was like, but why is it on this? So I tried to justify it for a long time. And it took me a long time to go, okay, whatever. And then after that, and then once, like, maybe like, um, like three, I'm trying to think. Because I used to play this album like crazy, man. And then I, after, like, maybe like a couple of months, then it kind of clicked with me. And then it kind of like went into the flow. I was like, okay, it's warming back up. Kind of thing like that. And I was like, great. It works right there. So for me, it's an 8, 8.5, 9, depending on my mood. But there's nothing to really say about the song except that it's brilliant. Yeah, in your, de- in, your def- in your defense, I can completely understand that. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's the most natural fit for this album. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it makes sense. Even if yeah. you're talking about thematically, I don't think yeah. this has a massive amount to do with it. Exactly. The yeah. yeah. Um, however, it, you know, she had to be convinced into making it into a single because she was mm-hmm. just like, you know, Vicky Leaks, whatever. Yeah. And her friends were saying that, no, 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 this, this song is dope. Right. Mm. And then she ended up being convinced to make it into a video. And yeah. like we said before, this is a good kind of like almost 20 months before the album actually leaked, right? Yeah. Before the album was released. Yeah. So it is a fish out of water. I completely understand yes. that in, in yeah. pretty much every way. Yes. Right. However, there's two things. One, I just love the song so much that yeah. it deserves to, it deserves to be part of her mm. album canon, right? No, great. I'm sorry. Yeah. Second of all, in a purely selfish way, mm. right? I want MIA to sell records. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you know she can do it more and that people get her. So I know what kids are like, right? When mm. they're looking through an album, the first thing they do is like, okay, do I recognize any of these songs? Oh wow, Bad Girls is on it. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's that's the literally the sole reason that Drake's Views album is selling so much right now. Oh, because of single, because of singles. Yeah, because the singles, because it's got one dance on it, it's got mm. controller, and mm. then in the future we'll have the one with Rihanna, too good. Yeah, these are the only reasons. Otherwise, it's a completely average album, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, Bad Girls, if it hooks people in, yeah. yeah because it is a popular song. It is one of her most popular songs. I'd say it's yes. probably up there. Behind, with, behind Paper Planes. It's probably, this, it's, it's probably Paper Planes than this one. Yeah, I, and then maybe XXXO. Maybe, but yeah. it's it's one of her top two most popular songs. So for yeah. me, it had to be included. Even if you had to kind of base other Bam things Wanky. around it. Yeah, like... Oh, then I'll, I, tell you how I, sold I'll tell you how I sold it. I, I sold it because I went back to the theme of it being like, the, like a like a like a movie in a way. I sold this one. I fan wanked it to be. <laughs> I, you, you, that's what we got to do with this song. I'm gonna be honest. I I've fan, never heard that phrase before. You never heard that? Oh yeah, you ever? You you get the, you get the concept behind it, right? Fan wanking. Like you gotta, oh yeah, yeah. You gotta brutally, it brutally. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. So to me, the way I the way I, I fan wanked it was it was intermission. That's what I put it as. It's like when you're going out to the theater, you're going out to the, the lobby. Go take your piss. Not to say that's a song you take a piss to. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like this is the part where everybody's like like just a breather. Exodus kind of closed out the first act. And everybody's kind of going out there and getting their stuff. And then boom, the boom skit comes and back and gets you worn back up for the for the second act, kind of thing like that. Yeah, I can All see right. that. I can see yeah. that. I might so, not have used the exact terminology, that used, <laughs> but, but yeah, I get the message. <laughs> Got you. All right. All right. So now we go to. Dun, 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 I want to start. Dun, I want to start. Dun, dun, dun. Here's the thing. For for the longest time, I went between I went between Caller and this as my favorite MIM album for the longest time. But then one thing happened, and that th- once that thing happened, and I took the boom the boom skit out, and I put that song in, then this one became the one that was my favorite. It only took that one thing, and for the longest time. When, we, when she first talked about the boom skit, she was like, "Well, there's a there's a there's a fuller version," and yeah. she's like, "It has it has it with the phone call with my with the with the with 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 my my lawyer on it, whatever like that." She's like, "But the song's not complete yet." And I'm like, okay, so when you first hear boom skit, 
you're like, okay, it's like a, it's like maybe like a minute and twenty seconds or something like that. And you're like, this beat is great, the flow is great, this is great. But why is this damn song a minute and a half? Why is this song not longer? So you so you so you, so you kind of in a way have to kind of like like get pissed off at the song because it's like this song should be longer. This song should be longer. So that this more even more so than Bad Girls, this song broke because once you start getting to the groove of a boom skit, you're like, okay, and then it goes doom. And like goes on the double trouble, like what the fuck? And like it takes you out of it every time. But once she put out Boom Ad, and I took out to me, to me as far as I'm concerned, Boom Skit is not even part of the album anymore. I just toss it out. I put Boom Ad right where it belonged because I'm pretty sure to add the, the part when he says add there, she's telling you to put this back into the album. So once you assert Boom's ad into the album, and you have that that second verse where she's talking about. Uh, I even I have, I have the, the the second verse is so great. I have to go. I have to read it out loud for the people out there. Do you know what? Goes, I've never I've never heard it before. All right, so you gotta hear it, man. All right, so the second verse goes: American tech outsourced to my city, made by a hippie. Yes, it's fucking trippy. Beatles in the '60s, Timbaland and Missy. I, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm gonna flow like she does it. American tech outsourced to my city, made by a hippie. Yeah, it's fucking trippy. Beatles in the '60s, Timbaland and Missy. Software, underwear, bootlegs in my factory. Hands so rough, but nimble like a pixie. Travel like a gypsy, made it so chicksy. This is how we made it to American history. It's not written, but we pin it in our country. Billions of brown people staying unlisted. Yeah, we get on Twitter and we would just crash it. Jesus went to India. Steve Jobs went to India. Now when you see me, you say, what the fuck's up, India? And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> When I heard that, 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 that verse right there, if you hear it, man, you got to play it for yourself. Once I heard that lyric, that lyric took the tangy being tied with, with, with Kala to being the one on top of it right there. For me personally, once you assert that second verse and then at the end of it, when she goes, so you never heard the whole boom ad, right? You never heard it? No, never, thing? never, never. Oh, you got to play it. Cause even at the end of it, cause it, even at the end of it, it even has like this, uh, this chopped and screwed version, like this, like this, like this, like this ten second chopped and screwed version of um, Double Trouble Bubble that goes right into the song. It's like, can you see me over? Cause I got a reputation. Good luck to you. And, it, and then once you once you put this song back into there, go from Bad Girl to the Boom Skit Boom Ad, and then go out to that one, it flows perfectly. And then that the, the part where she did the when the original boom skit where it just stops goes doom that shit is gone at that point kind of thing right there so right it's a full song now okay for what it's worth mm-hmm. yeah I I didn't know any of that until this week right wow however I still think boom skit works as a skit yeah I still yeah I still think the brevity works incredibly well. I didn't know there was a fuller version and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yes. But I still think it works really well as a skit. I mean, it's pro- I think we both said it. This is probably this is probably my favorite skit out of Yeah, that's her best skit. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And um you know, sometimes uh brevity can really help in a situation mm-hmm. and it makes it more special so I, I don't know for me I, I just absolutely love this I love the beat I love the flow I love the cheek of it you know that even the eat pray love bit I think one of her songs is even in eat pray love you know um from memory anyway and I don't know it's just it's it's brilliant brilliant gotcha. thing. and but the I, way that it leads into obviously I didn't know it leads in properly leads into double yes trouble. I, I got a feeling that like like I see what you're saying, but I would listen to this part. I, I would find find a way to listen to Boom Ad. Okay, no, no, I'm yeah. going to. Don't you worry. That's yeah. the first thing I'm doing after this podcast. <laughs> I'm gonna get that shit. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now. since since you didn't hear this part, so we can just go right into the double trouble bubble. Yeah. Start this yeah. Off. This is it's it's actually really funny. I was reading uh, Wikipedia about okay. this song, mm-hmm. and then. A quote came up from me about the song that I didn't even realize. It was like Jessel Padania says blah 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 blah, and I was like, oh my god, I didn't even realize that I'd said this about the song, but it was true. I was like, this song is fucking crazy, and it's yes. absolutely epic. Yeah. Yes, and it mixes in like three different genres. It yeah, has, three parts. Yeah, and and just the video actually, I think is. If you forget about Bad Girls and separate it from Matangi, I think this is yeah. the best video from Matangi. Yeah. 
Because actually, Yala and Bring the Noise, the videos for that, mm. I think they're okay. Yeah. Um, but this video is just the most ghetto video. It's just <laughs> such a depiction of council mm. state life in London, right? Mm. And um, and I love the chorus because the chorus, I don't know if it ever made it over there, but there was this, uh, this song by... A, Shampoo? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, oh, I never, I never made it. I never came we're up with trouble, in yeah. trouble. Something came along and. Oh no! Yeah, I know that song. Yeah, we know that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that song. Yeah. Yeah, we know that song. It, it was, it was used around, like it, it was it around the used, same kind of time as Chumbawamba, Tump Thumping. That it, kind it was, of era. They used that. They used that, song, they used that song in a lot of um, movie trailers. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Okay, so she she takes that chorus and flips it a bit, which yeah. was a great thing because it was yes. almost twenty years apart, right? Um. And also, I think this this song is uh, produced by the Party Squad, who are yes. dope. They're this Dutch uh, this Dutch production. Oh, they op- they opened for her at the concert I went to in New York. Oh yeah, yeah they did. Okay, so before that, right, I already knew about them because I've my, one of my best friends actually lives in Holland. So I kind of I stay in touch with the music scene out there, okay. and I knew that Party Squad were coming, and they had some absolutely awesome songs like Hella Mar. Well, they're and good. Stuff they're like good. That. They're, they're dope. So I was surprised that MIA got them, um, but it makes sense. And it makes sense just for a song like this. I mean, they just killed it. They absolutely killed yeah. it. I don't know if they did the whole thing, but they certainly just killed it, you know. I I know there's not much analysis to this one because it's just basically like saying you're – the song is what the song is, but the thing you can say about the song is that all three parts are brilliant. It's like, it's like okay, you got this part, and I'm like, what the hell? And then he goes to that part, like, what the hell? And then that final part with the with, 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 with the with the stomp beat, dum, dum, I'm like, holy shit! And the thing about it is, you know, like, and this, and this is the crazy thing about this song, it's it's like immaculately produced. But you know, how sometimes when, when 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 songs are immaculately produced and it sounds too shiny, but this one yeah. is like immaculately produced, but it still got that dirt and grime on it. It's like how, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, how is it still dirty and grimy when it's like pristine? It's like it's like pristine. But it's also grimy. I mean, like, how the hell did you pull that one off? I think I got a different version to this because there's two versions, right? Okay. So there's one trouble again that it's like an extra track that was yeah, in like so, Amazon. So on Rap Genius or Genius whatever, yeah. I think it has that second verse on it because I don't get that. I didn't no, get that's that on, on my version. No, we didn't get it either. That's on the version called Trouble Again. Right. Yeah, you have to get the Trouble Again version because it was like on Amazon, they like, you know how like these two, I, I don't know why they're still doing this in 2016. Where you're sep- where you like you gotta get this track for this for iTunes or this track on Amazon. I'm like, this stuff is dumb. So anyway, so on Amazon you have uh Trouble Again. And Trouble Again kind of like, has like a like a like an interpolated beat of this of the this trouble beat. And then she does that Willy Wonka, I'm gonna bleed you like a like I'm gonna be like a street fighter like Blanca, I'm gonna bleed you like a banker. Yeah. yeah that kind yeah, of thing like yeah. that. So I don't know why they do that shit like that. I guess they didn't want the song to be too long on here. I don't know. But that was a great verse right there. But I don't know. I mean, I think the song is the perfect length because yeah. it, you know, when you're switching styles so much, mm-hmm. you don't want to drag it out. Oh, and actually, it, yeah. that's a criticism that I do have of a couple of later tracks, right? Mm-hmm. More than one track on this album, I feel, is is too long and a bit indulgent. Whereas this one, I think, actually nailed it. I think it's the perfect length. So I can understand maybe why they cut out that second verse. Uh-huh. Um, so... But yeah, like you said, this is pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. I don't know where it fits into the the Hinduism theme and the whole Matangi concept. So maybe mm-hmm. you could explain. I don't know if it's supposed to. I don't. Know. <sighs> the best uh, I can say because I say with, with, with bad girls, like she got I jump. She got the singer Nirvana situation. Um, it's just basically I guess it's, it's like she goes back from out. I really can't honestly. I still got to think about it a little bit because this one is like it just works. The, the sound works well with the rest of the album maybe not so much with the overall theme but i think like this is like her party kind of situation right here so like the song is so good and the song like like, like the what the production works well with the rest of the album well it maybe doesn't have to necessarily be like a one for one ratio with the rest of it but i think it just works well with the song maybe it's like it's like her maybe it's like in a way it's, it's like her advanced version of xr2 in a way in a sense where it's like okay i'm just i'm just throwing i'm just throwing in this 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 dance hall like this dance hall jam kind of thing like that like a, yeah. like a like a like a showstopper right here this is her this is her showing off tune right here yeah i think that makes sense i yeah. think that makes sense mm-hmm. um when i was i was waiting for you to call 
and this was the last video that I watched when I was mm-hmm. like I was watching all of the videos from Matangi mm-hmm. and I looked at the comments on YouTube below and it was mm-hmm. just full of these kids who could not believe they'd never heard this song and they were just like <laughs> oh my god this is crazy this song yeah. is amazing the video is dope blah 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 mm-hmm. and I think this is my thing with MIA right mm-hmm. I think that she's clearly going to be one of those artists that wasn't appreciated in her own <laughs> era yeah that's obvious yeah right that that's not even the most intelligent thing i'd ever said it's just too easy, <laughs> too easy to say that yeah however i hope that in the future in the decades to come her legend mm. will grow because of yeah. songs like this because of videos like this right mm. that yeah. you know whether okay maybe it just might get sampled in a movie one time or this or whatever that but it brings but you, brings but you, the, kids you, to you it. want the proper appreciation that's what you want yeah well i think what happens is that in any generation mm. like of 17 year olds right mm. you get a group of them who are music obsessives mm. yeah now i was thinking about this earlier you get different kinds of music obsessives you get ones who their range is really wide so they like all different kinds of music but they might never get deep into any of it yeah mm. and then you get ones who whose range is very narrow so they're like five or six you know, singers mm. or bands and that's it. And they'll get super deep into it and obsessive and, you know, now for me, I'm one of the rare breed who have a very wide range of focus with music, mm. but also a very deep appreciation of it. Yeah. Yeah. Now in every generation of 17 year olds, you'll get like sort of 5% of them, maybe 3% oh, yeah. of them are like that. Yeah. Now, I'm lucky that I'm one of them. So for me, it's it's just natural that a song like this makes sense to me. If you play it to the other 97%, yeah, they'll probably go, what the fuck is this shit? Yeah. You know? Oh, they do. I gave my brother Cal, like, he was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> he, like, he, liked paper, yeah, he liked Paper Planes, but he's like, I said, what do you think of that album? He was like, it's too, I literally bought him a, a copy of it. I gave it to him, and I was like, what do you think of it? He's like, I like Paper Planes. He's like, but this is too much for me. He said, this is too much. Now that, that 3%, Every year, another three percent is born, right? Just generationally, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think that three percent, if song, if if MIA reaches them somehow, yeah, uh-huh. whether it's through, you know, music streaming services or videos or placement in Slumdog Millionaire or yeah. whatever, or just good old fashioned recommendation. Hey, I like this album. I think you'd like it too. Listen to it. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think that her legend will gradually, gradually grow over the next kind of twenty to thirty years. Do you years. think she's gonna be one of the people that people are gonna like? People are gonna be hot later on, or name checker, and people are like, who the fuck is that? Is it gonna oh, be yeah. one of them? Yeah, 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 absolutely, mm-hmm. right. And I think the other thing is, is that as music becomes more and more diluted, yeah, right, and <laughs> and kind of you know the more controversial elements are taken out naturally and and separated from the herd, uh-huh. yeah, because of things like you know music streaming sites which want to promote a certain thing through meritocracy yeah and and also political correctness because we've spoken about that before yeah yeah right? yeah as that happens yeah and the 97 percent accept that you know artists like mia shouldn't exist yeah mm-hmm. that three percent will defend her even more vociferously yeah and the ones of that three percent who haven't yet listen to music like hers i'm not saying her specifically but you yeah. know punk music but people, are adventurous. Music. but people are adventurous within a pop structure who who, yeah. can, who, who can work within a pop structure but still be adventurous nobody's also, saying you gotta, also nobody's rebellious, saying you gotta rebellious yeah. as well rebellious yeah. yeah she's the ultimate rebel yeah right in so but, many ways like to me and, i don't understand why 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 go off is not pop more popular uh, we'll get to that okay we'll get to that <laughs> let's just say it's not made much of an impression on me no no i don't know it's got a very album track feel to it it's not See, like it's, something it's, it's, that's got it's me, not it's, it's not, it's not, not got me hyped it's it, not got it, me hyped gotcha i think um the bird song thing is probably more a, a real feel of aim so the next the next two songs right are, are clearly supposed to go together yala yes. and bring the noise musically anyway yes. right mm-hmm. for me i love the songs to a certain yes. extent but mm-hmm. i don't th- i don't think they're the best songs that mia has ever done okay. i think the the good album song oh, mm-hmm. let me qualify that i'm okay. surprised that they were singles let's put it that way okay right however um, they're both great album tracks i'm not surprised by one but we'll get to that 
Okay. Um, so what are your thoughts on Yala? Okay, Yala is an 8 song. Sometimes a 7.5. It's the, the theme is simple. It's you, you always live always. It's more, of a, it's, it's more of a mantra, a chant. This is more of the chant song. It's the hook that sells the song. The, the, the actual verses are really nothing to write about. It's basically like just her just, just throwing free association. It's like one of her free association songs that she sometimes do. Yeah. That's right yeah. There. So, 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 the, so the lyrics... That's why it's sometimes seven point five. The the beat that is hot. The I, I, you know you know you're you're on Yala's legend is Yala's legend is, Yala is legend is this for me personally. The remixes that I heard on Yala, kill it. Like I heard one that the party the party for the party squad did. Uh, uh, yeah, I did hear that one. Actually. And, did ever, and that shit's that one is crazy crazy raw. But this one is kind of like. To me, this is more of like a warm up to the next one, but for me, it, it's it's simple. It's simple. It's a, it's an eight for me because the beat is hot, and it's enjoyable. But it's not the best thing MIA ever written. But it works within the album. It works yeah. as a buffer between Double Trouble and Bring the Noise. But that's that's pretty much how I, I have to say about it. Yeah, and it's I, a simple... to be honest, I completely agree with everything you mm-hmm. just said. Yeah. Yeah. For any for anybody else, for I, I'll, I'll say this about y'all. If anybody else had this song, they'd be happy as shit to have this song. But for M.I.A., it's like, yeah, I don't know if you ever seen that movie called Street Fighter. Uh, one with Raul Julia. Yeah. Where um, there's, there's this line where he's talking to Chun-Li. And he says to her, because like, she wanted to hunt him down because um, he, he, he wiped out her village. And then you know what he says to her? He goes, he goes um, um, for, for your village, the day I stepped there was the greatest day of their lives. But for me, it was Tuesday. And that's how I feel about this song. I was like, for any for any other artist, this would be the greatest song they ever had. And for me, it's Tuesday. That's how I feel about this song when it comes to MIA. So. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. <laughs> um, we can probably go straight to Bring the Noise then. All right. So, remember how we were talking about later, like how we're going to do Public Enemy, out, like albums? Yeah. And we're, and we're going to review like the, the first one, It Takes a Million. There's no greater tribute. Okay, this, 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 this is my third ten. And I'm explaining, it's going to be like, it's not going to be too long-winded, but this is the most public enemy song that M.I.A. ever did. Right down to the title of the song, Bring the Noise. Because the first song on It Takes a Million, It Takes a Nation of Millions to uh, to hold us back, is Bring the Noise. And there are throwbacks and callbacks to that album on here. Like small little lyrics that are right here and there that goes back onto it. And there's this thing where it's almost like it's like the it's like the spirit of it's like the spirit of that album to me for me personally it feels like the spirit of that album is right into this album it's kind of like it's kind of like an updated version of that but I know you don't have a frame of reference to it maybe that's why it, it, it's whatever but to me when I heard this song I was like this is purely Public Enemy and then there's this part near the end where like it's like she has the three verses I know on the on the on the video she has three verses. I mean, on two verses. And then on the album version, she had three verses. And then at the end of it, there's like this cacophony of noise. And that that noise right there, that situation, is like, that reminded me of that Public Enemy album so much that as a Public Enemy fan, that's why that's why this song means a lot to me. Because it's basically like like her like invoking the spirit of Chuck D, but in her voice kind of situation. Like there's one line where she goes, I'm a party fucking animal if you ain't scram. And then there's this, the, the end of A Takes a Nation of Millions is party for your right to fight. <laughs> so so for her to keep saying, I'm a party fucking animal if you ain't scam, I'm a party fucking animal if you ain't scam, and knowing that this song is basically a tribute to public enemy in a way, right there, and we hear that party for your right to fight kind of thing like that, there's no great, like, and, and that whole entire thing of I'm a freedom fighter, I'm going to sing this shit no matter what you tell me, because public enemy started name dropping all these different, like, revolutionaries and this and that. I'm like, for me as a public enemy fan, like this is like her, like her basic tribute to it. So that's kind of like why this is my, my ten. It's like that straight up noise rowdy. And like I never seen her. I know M.A. is not a rapper, rapper, but I'm gonna say out of the few times she's she's rapped, she rapped her ass off. Especially that third chorus with that kind of thing right there. Like that got me right there, kind of situation right there. So I can kind of see why. And this is the one where it's like I could play it annoyingly. But I can also see how if you're not a public enemy fan or if you don't have that kind of like like link with them, 
it's going to be an average song for for most people. I can see that one or two. So, is this your favorite MIA song then? It goes back and forth between this one and, and um, okay, okay, and and uh, hustle. That's interesting. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, for me, bring the noise. I mm-hmm. think there's a couple of issues with it, mm-hmm. but it's almost unrelated to the song itself. I think having Yala directly before drags it down a little bit by association, right? Not that Yala's a bad song, but I just don't think it was the right song to put directly before this, right? Gotcha. Um, second of all, like you said, I think even though the ver- verse number three is dope, for me, it it's more of a two verse song. Now, there are times when I'm in the mood where I'm like, wow, I love listening to her spit. Because she's never spit as much as she does on this. Exactly. Song. Yeah, never. Like, this is the most she's ever <laughs> on, on any song ever, yes. on any of her albums, anyway. Mm-hmm. Forget the mixtapes, but the albums, definitely. So, for that, it's something to treasure. That doesn't mean I always want to sit through the whole thing. Gotcha. And, and like, we are going to be covering Public Enemies, yes. like, especially, like, three albums of theirs. Yeah. Now, I've listened to those three albums, but a long time ago. So Mm -hmm. I'm not a big public enemy fan in terms of uh, like, you know, I liked them and stuff, but they never quite made it into my heart at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. So when we cover that, I'm really looking forward to it because obviously Rashad is a big, big public enemy fan. People, you got to understand that. (laughs) So He's he's basically going to be schooling me and (laughs) you lot about all this shit Mm. so i can't really wait so maybe we'll kind of come back to bring the noise at some Mm. point um if i don't understand the wider context to it so yeah um but it's definitely a dope song i think the video is a little bit i I don't know it didn't grab me like the double bubble trouble video is just sick um i think and i think that's what the bring the noise video was trying to be but it failed effectively um but yeah, those are my thoughts. So maybe one day we'll, re- we'll maybe in one of the public enemy ones we'll kind of revisit this song and then yeah, they yeah. can put it into context for me. So, uh, but it's definitely I definitely like it for sure. Um, it then, as you said at the end, there's like a breakdown in it, um, which is I love the breakdown of bring the noise at the end, and then that leads into lights. Yes. Yeah, lights is one of my favorite songs on the album. For me, it's the the natural end point actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, as I said before, there was an interesting story about this one. I think it's actually a brother presented the track to MIA. So now I don't know exactly what point in time she did this, but um, she was definitely touring. I think she said she was touring Maya. Maya, yes. So we can assume that maybe it's kind of like twenty late twenty ten, early twenty eleven, or something. And she said she was up in Scandinavia, and it was really cold. There was no daylight and stuff like that. And she said that alongside the reception to the album and stuff, um, touring with a young baby, she found it really difficult and she started getting a bit depressed. And then her brother one day brought this song to her and she absolutely latched onto it and it made her feel so much better. So every night she would play the song on repeat to fall asleep to and it just made her feel better. And it is exactly like her. <laughs> I, I only read this like what a couple of days ago. So my own opinions were very similar of this track that it was one to just so I didn't even know everything about what she was saying in it or actually the other singer is actually singing it yeah the other singer is singing huge parts of this song but I didn't realize um I just love the song it's the perfect end point of it so uh, what are your thoughts on this uh it's it's a nine for me personally because this is this is like the 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 improvement this is like the, the 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 sequel to tell me why that pretty much improved every part of that part. This is what uh, Tell Me Why I was trying to be, but it actually succeeded in being it at this point. That kind of like that, like that spiritual, hopeful kind of situation. Like the, the imagery with the uh, light that's in the sky, goddess bump the guitar, this and that. It's kind of like that, just, you're just taking in like the, the minutia of life rather than like the big overwhelming stuff and everything. Um, got to get another sweater from a helicopter, which I think plays into the the closing credits, um, like she's like it's like it's like she, after she came after she came from that 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 ruckus that she brought, like that's the like bring the noise to me was like like kind of like her 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 her, her, her final her final say on the Maya album. It's kind of like lashing out against that kind of situation 
which is why it's structured to be next to this song kind of situation, where it's like, okay, now I got the final parts of my rage out. I'm good with that. That and I'm gonna fight you, fucking fight you back, this and that. And now I'm gonna take in everything. This is what I'm fighting for. This is what I'm looking at. This guy, the Chinese dude, I went to check out. Um, I keep my distance even so I shine. Uh, lights on rings, cameras, and things flashing like bling. Loves bling when I sing. It's 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 it's, it's, it's there's two types of free association with MIA. There's there's like there's like sensual free association like this one. And then they're just like like populist free association like Yala, and this is the this is the free association in the light. It's like there's not really a story. It's just kind of like her just taking in everything, kind of looking at it, and everything that she's looking at kind of gives off this like light or a reflection or something like that kind of thing situation. It's kind of like it's kind of like one of the things where it's like I feel like when I hear this song, it's like when you when you go out with your friends for a night, and then you're kind of like you, you kind of have like that that tired but you're still euphoric kind of feel. You're walking down the streets. It's like chilly, but it's not too chilly. It's like just good enough, and like the sun's. It's like that 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 dust till dawn kind of thing. You're walking around, you're taking in the city, stuff like that. And normally, when you walk down the street, you're just noticing the city. But when you're at this point, and all of a sudden you got the little light and little like things, you're looking at the neon signs and this and that, and all of a sudden everything looks so pretty for that urban thing. Normally, you're just like okay, blase, blase, and that's what I get from this song. Yeah, I think the lights kind of thing within Hinduism, it's really obvious that when you talk about Diwali, it's the festival of light, right? Candles are a huge thing, not just in Hinduism. You know, you talk about um, Christianity there yeah. as well. In in many different religions, they are. And this this has a, it just has such a beautiful feel to it. And it's al- it's almost like a sensory experience, you know, like... Um, I don't know if you know what um you know that there's a, there's a condition um where you see sounds right synesthesia and I kind of have it actually like I have a minor form of it okay. so which always helped me with the DJing and the music production and stuff like that and just generally as a kid loving music I could see the patterns I could see cool. the, right and the different colors and stuff so whenever I hear any song or sing any kind of song i can see elements of it that gotcha. i to me i thought that's just how it works until i realized when i was older I was like, <laughs> according to other people this isn't normal right yeah um and this is a very very clear song for someone with synesthesia you could play this to them and they'll get it they'll just instantly get it they'll get mm-hmm. the visual uh, the visual element of it it's like a hate. yeah you're just it's just it's a brilliant song i wish it, that this had closed the album i wish mm-hmm. it had you know gotcha. um i think this is the perfect end point for it so yeah but there was a song after this well was- <laughs> <laughs> gotcha so we're gonna go to this one we'll let you start this one off first um i just i really don't have a lot to say about no it ain't right I was so hung up on lights that this song to me almost doesn't exist. And and plus when you factor in sex that is coming after it, every time lights came on, I just what I'd basically stop the album effectively. I think the amount of times I've listened to this, I've listened to Matangi a hell of a lot, but uh, like the album, but I've not listened to this song that much because the first kind of five, ten times it made such little impression on me that I was like, OK, that's it. I'm done right i'm just done with this and then i started listening to my own playlist so i'm probably the worst person in the world to ask about this song gotcha all right so i mean the, the title says it all no it ain't right we know it ain't right we're doing it anyway kind of situation like that i mean it kind of it, it, it kind of leads right back into that you can have an all but tell me what tell me what for kind of thing right there i like as much as i love lights i think like to me like i i get why i i I get why you think lights should be the end like that kind of like Blowing off because to me, like to me, like because there's an argument to be made that if, if if you take if you take Maya and you Matangi the sequel, then Lights ends the same way that Maya ends, which kind of like just drifts off. Whereas where Maya ends off and it kind of like drifts off into like like a nothingness, then and like like kind of like a darkness, then Lights drifts off into like this light world. So. It kind of, so it's kind of like that that kind of like like that kind of like um what's the one I'm looking for 
juxtaposition of like light and dark. Whereas like that that darkness she was feeling, that dark, stark emptiness, she wants to unplug from everything from Maya. She kind of replugs herself into the the light world in this one. And that will end it. However, I feel that even though she herself can kind of reconnect into that thing, there's still so many other people that don't know what's there's so many people that know they're doing things wrong and the, and the work's not done right there. It would be nice if we could end up lights. It would be nice if we could just like drift off into this kind of situation right there, the spiritual landscape right there. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like, it's kind of, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, like, like a sad ending in a way, because even though she's found all this enlightenment, there's so many people out there still doing things that she knows isn't right. And if, and, and the thing that frustrates her is, is that we know this shit ain't right, and we're still doing it. So by the time it comes into, we learn how to discuss uh, sex, uh, sexist because it, we just discuss exodus. So it comes out to that thing where it's kind of like, it was like you guys want everything, but what are you doing it for? And if you're doing it for think for the wrong reasons, then how are we doing this shit? Kind of like that. So I felt like it kind of like it kind of like the lights kind of gave you hope, but she's still saying there's still fucking work to do. Like the whole entire thing with uh with the um the concept of a uh, not. Natsumi and Tsunami, where it's like the um, the yin and the yang kind of thing like that. She's like, no matter how much you can be a light, and there's still that dark side out there that you kind of got to work at. So the argument that you could say it can end, like I say, intellectually speaking, if you want to end it on on um, light, there's no argument whatsoever on that one. I feel right there that uh, it should end right there. But I think as as far as the as far as the the rest of the album, I think. But there's an alternative where it's like, okay, you found that enlightenment. I found that enlightenment. She found that enlightenment. Maybe other people around the world have that enlightenment. But there's still so many people out there who don't know things are right. And it's kind of like our goal to kind of like let them know what the shit's all about. Kind of deal right there. So that's how I see it right there. But I wouldn't argue. I wouldn't argue that if somebody said they want to take the song off the album, I would have no problem with it. But to me, I like the way it ended right there. I even like the feel. Like I love the feel of of light because it kind of like gives me like hope and I like that mellowness but this one kind of gives me melancholy it's like a melancholy feel so I kind of like the fact that even though you find enlightenment there's still always going to be the sadness it's kind of like it's kind of like you have those moments where everything's like is like it's like just going right for you but you always know that there's this, there's this nagging feeling that shit's not right no matter how hard you got it, 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 it oh yeah yeah, so that's kind of thing. So I feel like that was. I feel like this is a strong. I feel like this is a, a, a great ending. But I also wouldn't argue your point that it can go off right there. Because if you if you compare it to Maya, then if you, if you want to do a one to one ratio to Maya, then it should have ended on lights. But I think as the thesis, and I kind of think like we got work to do. It kind of goes back to that warrior situation where it's kind of like it's kind of like your job to start telling people it's the same. So going back to so so go back to public enemy for a moment. It's kind of like Chuck, one of Chuck D's philosophies in Public Enemy is, is like, okay, the, the individual is important, but it's better to work at it as a team. And if the team's not working together, then how are we going to get shit done? And it's kind of like that, that this song kind of puts it back out in that kind of thing, where light is kind of like how you're seeing the world. It's kind of like now, how are we going to get other people to see the world kind of sense? So, hmm. that's, I mean, that's the way I see it, though. So. I mean, I'll, I'll listen to it again with- mm-hmm that kind of frame because that mm. probably helps me a bit so yeah um so yeah and then and then we go into sexodus right i mean did you want to say anything about sexodus no i mean i just i would say people if you listen to the album and you know how i feel about the whole thing about the closing credits i mean it's everything that the story's already told it's just like like as you're leaving the movie theater it's like okay you still got work to do but as you're leaving the movie theater keep in mind that she's still saying you can have everything. What are you gonna do? What, what are you gonna do about it? Pretty much. And then a helicopter kind of takes off. I would be shocked if there's not a helicopter sound that starts off aim. I would really be shocked. Okay. That, that's how I feel about it. I mean, if it is, I'm like, holy shit. But like, like you said, I I wouldn't blame anybody for taking it off either. Like to me, for for the way I see the whole entire album, like I see like there's there's part one, which is um um. Uh, Arvilar, part two is Kala, part three is Maya, and part four is Matangi, which is the epilogue, which kind of like wraps everything up in a, in, 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 
as much of a bow as M.I.A. could do, and then the, the closing credits is that song playing through as you're walking out the door. And then that's what the last thought she wants to leave out with you. And my ideal of AIM, if it comes out, if it works out the way I work, that's more like a, a, a postscript, if anything. I think her story, like for me, I think her artistic story is done here as far as this album. But I think AIM is more like a postscript. Something that you can add on if you want to or you if, you, if or if you don't. But I think everything she's ever needed to say, unless she comes out, unless she does something on that album that takes me out of like left field, but I don't know. I tell you what, mm-hmm. let's wrap up mm-hmm. Matangi, yeah, yes. with closing thoughts on it, and then we'll talk about AIM and what we're expecting it to be like properly, like not 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 for too long because no, no, no. you know. But but I think because um, obviously we're going to do a podcast to cover it once it comes out. Yes. Um, but what are your closing thoughts on Matangi? My closing thoughts on Matangi are basically this: um, if she had just made three albums and then made another album, I'd have been satisfied. But I'm glad that she made this album because for me personally, I think as a collection of songs, I think this is the for me. I think I enjoy the structure of this album more than the other three. But I understand the argument if pe- other people prefer the other ones. To me, on a personal level, this one affects me on a personal level because of the fact that I am a, I'm a relatively spiritual person. I'm not a specifically spiritual person as far as it comes to religion. But her, her the point of view that she has in this, in this story and this album as it pertains to the other three albums, I'm very closely aligned with. There's, there's only been three artists that they're POVs that I've been like almost for one for one as far as worldview that I've been mixed up and she's one of the three. The other one is Chuck D and the other one is this guy named Hideo Kojima. So that's my final like thoughts on that one. Okay, for me, Matangi um, is just a beautiful, unexpected surprise. I thought at this stage when it was released i wasn't expecting much from it and i didn't think it would be as good as this no way on earth i wasn't expecting after maya after the controversy after this and that and it kind of taught me not to doubt mia um she can always kind of bring it back where necessary um i saying all that i still think for me that and I'm I'm willing to revise this after this podcast because, you know, I'm always open to changing things. But for me, the playlist that I had that I created afterwards, I'm going to run through it now. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it's got 11 tracks on it. It starts with Come Walk With Me. It goes into Only One You, then Warriors, then Attention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I did actually include Exodus at that point. Right, mm-hmm. so after uh, I kind of went with it, okay, but within a shorter album, I think it works as a centerpiece. Yeah, mm-hmm. then going to Bad Girls, Boom Skit, Double Bubble Trouble, Yalla, Bring the Noise, and you end on Lights. Okay, so effectively, what I'm doing is removing Sexodus, mm-hmm. uh, remove Noah Ain't Right, mm-hmm. and c- more controversially, uh, removing the first two tracks, which are Carmageddon and Matangi. Gotcha. Right. Now, Carmageddon for me, I don't think it competes with Come Walk With Me opening mm. the album. Yeah. Matangi, I think I've grown to love it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I th- I think I would now include that into the album at some point. I don't know when, maybe the second song or uh, I don't know. It's mm-hmm. a difficult one because it's <laughs> such an obvious it's such an obvious intro track. I think I wrote in my original review that this is just basically distilling the first three albums but not Mm -hmm. as well so yeah but it has since grown on me so Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean i don't want to go on too long but i think it's a great album it's not my favorite Mm mia album but it Mm -hmm. definitely contains many of my favorite moments from her career Mm -hmm. and and it contains so many bits of pure creativity that Mm -hmm. only someone like her could conceive Mm -hmm. and i think you can't really say anything more than that that's just genius really Mm -hmm. And obviously we are fans of her, but we do see her with realistic eyes as well. We don't see her with rose-tinted glasses. Oh, yeah, yeah. Saying that, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe one of us does see her with rose-tinted glasses because Mm -hmm. one of us has met her. 
<laughs> That's just on a purely like like okay, so I so I went to a concert to see her in New York a couple years ago when when uh, Matanga came out, and um, so the, it was a night before the album came out. So she already had like album copies. She was like, if you buy an album, then she'll sign. She'll if you buy a CD, she'll sign your CD or whatever like that. Couldn't take pictures or anything like that. So we got so I got in line and wait for her right there. But I'm cool. So normally like I'm, at, at the show, I was at front stage, so she's right in front of me and I'm fine. But you always have that 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 cognitive dissonance when you're on like when somebody's on stage and then you're on the bottom. So I was like, okay, she's literally right there. I can literally touch her shit if I wanted to. So I'm like, okay, whatever. So I had no problem right there. So we're in line waiting for her, blah 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 blah. Line goes up. Uh, we go around. She had three people at a time, kind of like signing stuff like that. So I go in there and she's looking down at at the at the um the uh, CDs. She's signing them, so she's not looking up. She looks up at the person she's signing the CD to. So I'm still fine. I'm like right in front of her. She's not looking at me yet. And I'm look, and she's looking at that person. I'm like, okay, whatever. And I was ready to be all clever and car charming and all crap like that. So she goes to mine and I'm standing in front of her and she looks at me. And I don't know if you guys know about that that Puss in Boots character from, from Shrek. You know how Puss in yeah. Boots has those eyes and look at yeah, you yeah. And, and people get like dazed by it. So she looks at me, right? And then all of a sudden in my vision, the whole room gets dark and it's just, just her sitting at that chair. <laughs> And then I had no words, and then I, I I said thank you, and then all of a sudden I don't know what happened. As I took the CD, my legs started moving away from the table, and I was like, "Thank you, you have a good night." And I just kept moving. I don't know what happened. So basically, I I, I, I had an opportunity to like like woo her, but I missed my shot. So there you go. <laughs> Listen. Listen, Maya, if you're listening to this podcast <laughs> and you remember this guy who <laughs> who you looked at with the Puss in Boots eyes and you, you secretly fell in love with him, <laughs> but it, you know, it was some sort of forbidden love situation because you were sitting <laughs> one side of the table <laughs> and you thought you'd never see or hear from him again. <laughs> his, na- his name is Rashad. You can get at him. You can get at him. <laughs> but yeah, so basically what you're saying is like that you had kind of tunnel vision and then like everything sort of went all crazy and yeah, you had, you I, had like an out of body experience. Yeah. Cause I'm like, like, like the last thing I would think of am I is innocent. But when she looked at me, she's like an innocent angel. I was like, what the fuck? I'm like, I was like, like, you know, I'm expecting her to go I'm like, blah, blah. But she looked at me and I'm like, Oh, she's like a little angel. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, all, all the curse words, all the getting drunk, getting high, all this shit, middle fingers all went out the window. She was like an angel. I was like, God damn, she's so innocent. Wow. <laughs> I don't know how I got that one, but that was crazy. Yeah, so that's pretty much that right there. Okay. Um, as I recover from the fits of hysteria, <laughs> let's talk about AIM. Yeah. What do you what do you reckon is gonna happen? I think what's gonna happen is this. I think it's gonna be one of them albums. Where, and just because I heard, because I heard some of the tracks on there, because she she played tracks on a on um on a, on Periscope. This is going to be the album where people are going to. I, I I I'll say this. I'm interested in seeing people's reaction to the bird song, because if if the reaction to the bird song is what I think it's going to be, this is going to be her her. It's gonna be. I think it's gonna be a, a very good album, maybe great, but I think this is gonna be her trolling album, her troll album kind of thing. I got this feeling because right. the, the the hook from 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 that bird song is is hilarious. It's, it's hilarious even for her. I'm like, who the fuck does that? It sounds like I, I'll tell you what the bird song sounds sounds like. It sounds like somebody got drunk and they turned on like uh, like they, they, they took a western song. They digitized it and started screaming cuckoo. <laughs> and they're like really happy saying cuckoo. For like, <laughs> I can't even explain it. It just sounds like you want to, you, 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 like, like, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like the parrot, like, like, like the green parrot from, um, from a tangy. Like got a cowboy hat on, got a holster with some six shooters, and went into a saloon and, and said draw a pilgrim. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. 
<laughs> I can't wait. It's going to be hilarious. That's going to be a trolley song. If she trolls, if she trolls it the way I think she's going to troll it, it's going to be a masterpiece of trolling. I just got this feeling. But I mean, she's already trolled us on Twitter. You know, she kind of no, but this, but talking, okay, initially just, said like that Diplo produced it, and then five minutes later, said, no, it's Blackstar. No, but okay, that's what I'm, this is what I'm saying. Like you, like 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 look at that. That like even when I look at the image of that 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 purple like that that, that green thing and the black star thing, like that's what I'm saying. I think this is going to be one of the what the fuck songs. It's gonna be it's gonna be a song where where if somebody turns on the radio and it pops on, like what the fuck is this? That's gonna it's gonna be the what the fuck is this song? I guarantee you right there. The feeling that I get right <laughs> uh-huh. is. She's like a similar age to Kanye, right? Uh-huh. I think they're around the same kind of age. Yeah. And I reckon I'm not 40 yet. Yeah, uh-huh. I've still got a few years to go. Yeah. But I reckon once you turn 40, something snaps in your head. Yeah, <laughs> especially if you if you're an artist, something snaps in your head where you actually start wanting to just troll everyone. Right? <laughs> now, if you think about what Kanye has done on the life of Pablo this year, yeah, and how popular it, it, he's become as a result of it, of trolling Taylor Swift <laughs> and uh, pretty much everyone on earth. And, uh-huh. you know, like just, I think, I mean, Life of Pablo is actually one of my favorite albums this year. Uh-huh. I don't even, it's not the best album out this year. But you, enjoy, but you enjoy it, yeah. But I really enjoy it a lot uh-huh. of, of it, like, especially the original 11 track version of it. That's what I really enjoy. M- more so than Jesus? Yeah, miles more. I mean, I, I always like I always liked users because mm. I think there is there are a good number of decent songs on there for sure. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I think Life of Pablo is something really interesting. Um, and and very very tongue in cheek. A lot of it is very yeah. tongue in cheek, and I I kind of get that feeling. Maybe that's what this is going to be like because twenty sixteen has been such a messed up year, uh, and and I, I think. I think this. I can see this just being a messed up album. Oh, let me tell you something. You know? Can you tell me some of the titles of the songs? All right, she has a song Go called. On. She has a song called Swagistan. <laughs> and she has a song. Oh, get ready for this one. She has one called Ali. Are you okay? <laughs> About an Uber driver named Ali, and you know that Michael Jack, like you know some criminal Ali. Are you okay? <laughs> She has a song called Ali, Are You Okay? She has this. That's what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about, man. Yeah, I, yeah. Th- I think. I think. I think you may be onto something. When I heard Swag no, say that. When I heard said my song called Swag is Dan. Oh, and she, got, and she has this one song called um, uh, Friends Forever or, or Finally Friends or something like that. Oh, Foreign Friend. And, he, and she has like this. And the hook is like this. Like this, like this oldies, like Otis Redding kind of guy. I thought you were my best friend. And that was. <laughs> uh, I gotta stop. All right, we're good. We're good. Okay, yeah. But yeah, but so get ready. That's what I think is gonna happen. It's gonna be an epic troll of an album. It's gonna be good songs. Don't get me wrong. The songs are gonna be good. Because the snippets I heard of it, it sounds like it's gonna be good shit. But I think there's gonna be some epic trolling in that album. I guarantee you right now. Okay, okay. I think that makes sense. I think, judging by what this year has been like, I think that makes sense. And I think it's good that you framed that for us, <laughs> so that we know what to expect. Gotcha. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Because um, once uh, aim is out. Mm-hmm. We will obviously need a bit of time to digest it and yes. figure out what's going on properly. So, because if we're going to do a podcast on it, we need to get it right. Um, yes. And after that, it would be good if we could discuss her five albums all together in terms yes. of rank rankings, stuff like that, favorite songs. Because I, I know we know your top three yeah. say favorite songs, but maybe like a top ten and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I also really want to discuss her videos and her artwork, the album artwork. Yes. We've not really touched on that. And obviously this is a vocal, like, you know, thing. We haven't got imagery that we can... Mm-hmm. But there's nothing to preclude the listener from just... Google it. Google it, yeah. Yeah, Google just it, yeah. Google it and then see what we're talking about, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've still got a lot to cover. And clearly we have talked about... 
<laughs> she, uh, my 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 wife today was like, "Oh, so what podcast are you doing today?" I said, "Oh, MIA." She said, "He's still doing MIA." <laughs> She's like, "You've been talking about her for hours and hours and hours." I was like, "I know, I know." And she still got an album out next month. She, and my wife just, you know, she just gave me, she just rolled her eyes at me. And, 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 oh God, that's hilarious. Um, but I almost, I almost want to change our our uh, our podcast to Ali, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> or podcast, are you okay, or some shit like that? I got a feeling that's gonna be my song. I got this feeling that's that's gonna be my song. I just got this gut feeling that's gonna be that. But anyway, I'm sorry. Continue. I'm sorry. Go back. I, I detoured. Go no, I I don't think there's anything <laughs> more to add really okay. than Ali, are you okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so, so okay, that's Matangi wrapped up then. Mm-hmm. And um, that's our little crazy preview of AIM. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take a pause for the cause and listen to AIM properly, digest it, and mm-hmm. we'll hit you back with another podcast after that. In the meantime, we do have other stuff to cover. Yeah. Um, just to let give you a brief taster, we're doing things like Public Enemy, mm-hmm. uh, the Star Wars prequels, um, we might get into some Lupe fiasco. We've got very broad taste. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. And uh, and we might have some other separate kind of stuff coming up as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, we hope you've enjoyed this uh, this look back at MIA's four albums. Uh, we know it's, it's it's in crazy forensic <laughs> detail. Um, yet some of the songs we don't even scrape the surface. It's crazy. Oh, no. MIA MIA is that kind of artist. We could really talk about her all day, but then my wife would probably divorce me. So <laughs> we, we have to cut it off at some point. Effectively. Yeah. Um, but we hope you've enjoyed it because I don't think we'll be doing this for every artist. I'm sure like oh, most no. podcasts will be regular podcast length, but for MIA, we do have a lot of love for her. So this is yes. why we've, we've done this for her. So uh, yeah, on that note, um, we'll say um, bye till next time. My name is Jessel and... Rosh. So, peace. Peace out.